All right. Hi, everybody. I'm still digesting my lunch. Okay, so this is a uh, well. First off, before we get into uh, today's lab, does anybody have any questions about the work from uh, the pipetting lab last week? I'll just give us time to go over everything. If you have any questions or stuff in the the assignment didn't make sense, stuff like that. because that should be due this evening. I've changed the fiddle around with the schedule, but I'll, I didn't have time to check everything on Blackboard. So I'll post that after uh, we finish this. So everything's up to date. I think that was a, a weird thing with a mix of different schedules from different semesters. Okay, so. Today shouldn't be too long of a lab, partly because you're <laughs> the thing that takes the time, which is running the gel you're not going to need to do. Oh, hey, Adam, nothing much. We just had a little bit of time for any questions about the pipetting uh, lab from last week, uh, which is due this evening. <clears throat> that and me picking my lunch out of my teeth. Uh, that was pretty much it. Make sure she doesn't pee on the cup and the rug, okay? Okay, so let's bring up the standard curve stuff. And so kind of the main aims from today really are to kind of give you some background about gel electrophoresis and really how that ties into the properties of DNA and how you can use that as a tool to investigate different things or use it as a, uh, I mean, typically what I use DNA electrophoresis for is checking to make sure what I've done is correct. Um, that's kind of my main use of it. But there are lots of obviously different approaches depending on what kind of question you're asking. And so uh, one big thing from today is basically how this process works, right? The properties of DNA, the properties of the, the gel through which you're gonna be passing this DNA and kind of what that produces in terms of an output, right? In terms of an image. Then the, the second kind of point is to kind of give you a, an idea of how you can figure out what you have in terms of uh, fragments of different sizes. And then finally, the, the, the third kind of main aim is to get you to translate all of that into essentially generating a standard curve for uh, two different sets of DNA markers, right? And a big part of the assignment on Blackboard is you doing that analysis, giving me the data that you have, and then generating uh, a couple of graphs, which you will then upload, right? So uh, where's, yeah, go away. Where's the lab gone? So I have to wait for like the Zoom thing to disappear so I can get to my tabs. Now that one, uh, you don't want to see that. Okay, so if you go to uh, course content, obviously you have the handout, uh, which I have open right now, uh, but you have some semi-log paper 
So you can plot your different values out on that paper. I print it out on a printer, let's say, and then draw that up, take pictures of it. So you, again, you need to do two different graphs, one for each of the DNA marker. If you just do one alone, you'll get four points for that and no points for the second one. And then you have to upload those to the uh, assignment in the bit where it tells you to do so, which is, here we go. So uh, these first two questions, question one and question two, first one is for the pro mega size and standard, and I'll get into what that is and tell you, tell you about that in a little bit. Draw the graph could be on that semi-log paper or it could be in Excel. The only thing you need to be careful of is that the um, size axis, which is the Y, needs to be in log form. That's what the semi-log paper is. So the semi-log is y-axis log, x-axis, I don't know what the equivalent would be, linear maybe, non-logarithmic. So if you draw this in Excel, which is perfectly appropriate thing to do, you need to make sure that the y-axis is a log axis. Otherwise, you'll get a curve. And even though this is technically called a standard curve, it's not actually a curve, it's a straight line. So, so you can do all kinds of fanciness in Excel if you have, have the appropriate chops and inclination, uh, but you don't need to. You can just do it on paper with a uh, pencil. And as long as you do everything that you're asked to do in the question, you will not be treated any differently as to whether you do in Excel or if you do it on paper. But you have to use that semi-log paper. You can't really, I wouldn't suggest, try just drawing it on ordinary graph paper or on a napkin or anything like that. It's not going to come out the way that you want it to. Anyway, that's a little bit of a distraction, so let's get out of this. Oh, and the rest of the questions are really about the values that you calculate using those graphs. Right, so if you look on here, I'm asking you to do that for the uh, what the values of those bands are, what that generates using the two different graphs, and so on and so forth. Right. It's fairly straightforward. Oh, I need to. I need to save these questions. I need to get out of here. So the other things that you you need, obviously, along with the lab handout, is the gel picture. So this would be essential. Well, this is a student's gel picture. I can't remember from what semester, but this is exactly what you would be generating yourself if you're doing this in person. And this is what you all are going to use to create those graphs. And I'll get back to this in a little bit, uh, make a little bit more sense. And essentially those calculations you're generating for the different fragments, you're gonna compare those to these expected fragment sizes and see which marker is the more accurate. That's really like the, don't know what that image is. I think we can just get rid of that. Okay, so going back to the actual lab itself, the thing that we really rely on in, well, there's two things really in gel electrophoresis. One is the property of DNA. 
in terms of its charge. And the other one is the property of the gel, the, the sub, or not substrate, the thing that we're moving that DNA through. And so does anybody know what charged DNA has? Isn't or, it uh, neutral? Nope. Or negative? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got three possible chances. It's negative. Do you know why it's negative? I know it was in the homework. Isn't it because we have our hydroxyl group is that why it's negative close but no cigar because the in the actual depths of the dna right in the dna backbone you won't find any hydroxyl groups because they've all been used to create phosphodiester bonds oh, okay what else is in the backbone other than the sugar the it's male the male phosphate male. right is it the phosphate backbone that's negatively yes. Charged. Actually, was that Jordan who's speaking or Adam? <laughs> Trying to recognize your, your voices. Whoever it wasn't that was Jordan. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whoever else it was. Um, in a sense, actually, you are right. I kind of jumped a gun a little bit on that. It's the hydroxyl groups, but it's not the hydroxyl groups on the ribose sugar. It's the OHs on the phosphate group which lose their protons and therefore are negatively charged. So both you and Robert are right for kind of different aspects of that. The negative charge is from the phosphate group and um, that's because of the OH groups that are part of that phosphate. Now that actually is an important property that we'll come to later when we talk about chromatin formation and like the ultrastructure and epigenetic regulation of transcription. Right, so kind of keep that property in your mind because we'll come back to it in the future and it's an, and a really important one too. So DNA is negative. So if you place DNA in a something and apply a voltage difference, the DNA should move towards the positive uh, anode, right? Because it has a negative charge. So if you just put some DNA in some water, and then you know, stuck your battery probes or whatever on either side and applied a voltage, all of that DNA would move over to the, the positive, uh, I don't know if it's, I think it's anode. Yeah, I think cathode is negative. I'm not 100% sure on that. Which is great. So, uh, so want... does it follow the same, uh, uh, sorry if I'm interrupting you, I'm trying not to. Does it follow you the same uh, uh, you can naming convention as, as uh, cations and anions? The cathode and anode? So an anion is a negative ion. That's all I can remember yeah. from high school chemistry. So uh, if if it does follow the same convention, uh, cation or cathode would be positive. And uh, a oh. chemistry teacher gave me a gimmick to remember, even as, if it's a bit corny. Uh -huh. uh, cations are positive, like cat paws. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> that might be something to, to pass on to other students because that's how I remember it when it comes to chemistry. That's really funny. Like I said, all I remember <laughs> is a negative ion is an anion. That's, that was kind of the, the equivalent that my chemistry teacher gave me. Um, so yeah, it doesn't really, it's to the positive uh, terminal essentially, um, whether that's a cathode or anode, I should check. It doesn't really matter what the name is, but it's to the positive end. And so if you have a voltage difference, that DNA will all move as a unit towards that positive terminal. But we don't want that to happen. What we want to happen is for that DNA to separate out, right? Because when you can, because you can look at DNA with a spectrophotometer, right? And detect how much you have there, but you can't tell whether you have lots of little pieces or, or a few large pieces it all looks the same. So gel electrophoresis is really about separating out the DNA by size. And uh, 
Oh, it's a former student of mine. She'll have to wait, unfortunately. I'll call her back after lab. So what we need is some kind of structure which will essentially filter DNA based on its size. And that's the gel part of gel electrophoresis. And so this gel, which you can kind of see a picture of it down here, it's made out of agarose. And agarose is, as far as I'm aware, the same stuff that they use in McDonald's milkshakes to make it nice and thick and creamy. Kind of that, can barely suck it up a straw kind of uh, thickness to it. That's something to think about. It's basically made from uh, seaweed. So, hey, Sov, do me a favor and turn that off, would you love? Sov, whoever's over there, can you turn that off, please? Thanks. Um, sorry, sugar rush on TV. Uh, it's a little distracting. So, uh that stuff from seaweed what happens is that once you isolate it it's like a i think it's basically like a long uh branch chain polysaccharide from what i can remember when you add it to water and you heat it like you melt it essentially those chains kind of form a mesh right and so they make like this uh kind of mesh network which has a series of like Basically, it's full of tiny, tiny holes, like holes you can't see. So if you held the gel up to the light, it would just look a uniform, kind of translucent uh, thing, blob. But those tiny, tiny holes are sufficient for DNA to pass through. Now, you can control the concentration of agros in that gel. And so the more agros you have, the more cross branching you have, the smaller the holes are. The lower the concentration, not only is your gel kind of floppy like a dead fish, but also the holes are larger. And so DNA can pass through more easily. <laughs> yes, well, I kind of like it too, Rose, but not when I'm teaching. Um, and so if you kind of manipulate that concentration, what you can do is you can filter the DNA. And so essentially what happens is that the voltage difference is the same. You're still exerting the same kind of pull. In many ways, actually, you're, you're exerting a stronger pull on the larger bits of DNA because they have a more of a negative charge. But they have to make their way through those tiny holes. And so the smaller fragments for any given concentration of agaros can kind of zip their way through pretty quickly. And the longer, larger fragments kind of have to make their way like kind of, you know, those kind of giant Chinese dragons sort of flown around in space through that gel to get to the positive terminal. And so if you apply that voltage for a certain amount of time, essentially you have like a wacky races where the small fragments move very quickly down the gel and then the bigger ones go more slowly. And so now you separate your DNA by size, right? And this is how we can visualize what DNA we have, right? And the other step is you have to dye that DNA with something because you can't see it with the naked eye. And so we use, um, for safety's sake, something called gel red. And basically what it does is it sticks to the DNA. And when you shine UV light on it, it fluoresces red. And so that's how you can visualize uh, the DNA. So if we look at this uh, picture here, this is a picture of a gel. The gel is actually a, a little bit bigger than that, the actual physical size of it. And each of these kind of columns comes from a well. You can actually just see one up there in the top right. It's kind of caught the light a little bit. So you get a little bit of uh, reflection from the walls. And so you place your DNA in those wells, and those are essentially literally holes that you put the DNA into in the, in the gel. And then you apply the voltage difference down, essentially down your screen, right? So positive would be the bottom. 
And so those bands then, sep those bits of DNA separate out by size with the smallest pieces at the bottom and the largest at the top. And they are all labeled with that dye. So when you shine that UV light on them, they fluoresce red. And this, that's what's captured. It's not this red color, but it's actually just captured as a black and white image. The red just tells you that it's there's a lot of DNA there and more than you can accurately kind of quantify with the camera at that exposure. Um, sir, are you showing us like a certain picture you're talking about? Can you see the the gel picture? It's, no, it's still it it's still stuck on the standard curves and oh. electrophoresis. Shoot, I'm sorry. Professor fail there. Good point. Thanks for uh, the heads up. Oh, I made a fool of myself. Sure, I kept you. talking about that. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll probably be like, what the hell is he talking about? So, yeah, this is the, the gel picture. I, I hit the wrong button when I went to share on, on Zoom. That's all. Yeah, so these, each individual, um, each individual line is a piece of DNA, right? So that all of the DNA in that line is of the same size. Uh, some of the bands are a little bit thicker just because there's, there's more DNA there, kind of occupies a bit more space. And the, the red bands are red just because there's so much DNA there. The signal, the light signal is more than the computer can accurately quantify. So it just says too much and labels it red. Right, so each one of these columns is a different well. Right, you can, let's go back. Actually go back to what I was showing you, ha. Huh. Right, and so here on this uh, kind of teeny tiny picture, right, is a picture of the gel and essentially these slots or holes is what you load the DNA into and then you apply the, the voltage difference. And so if you leave it running for a while, like 40 minutes or so, about 100 volts, these kind of globs of DNA, which you put in up here originally in the wells, will migrate down the gel, but they'll migrate at different rates, depending on their size. So larger fragments, which the ones at the top migrate at a lower rate. So for a given amount of time, they will move a shorter distance. And the small ones, and this is, oh, that might be 100 base pairs. I'd actually have to check uh, the marker, right? Moves very, very fast, right? And so actually so fast, you have to be careful that they don't fall off the end of the gel. So you can't, if you keep running this for any length of time, like the whole lot will migrate through the gel and each bit of DNA will pop out the other side into the, into the buffer. And so if you're doing just a general kind of science experiment, do I have the right fragment? Did my PCA, PCR work? Right, this is the kind of stuff we'll be doing later on in the semester for the um, fly bioinformatics project. Then these markers are good enough, right? So the lanes on the left and on the right, these are what are called molecular weight markers. And so these are samples of DNA where you know, because the manufacturer tells you, how big each sample, each bit of DNA is in terms of base pairs. So if you go, where's the effort tech? Oh, it's in the, it's in here. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, it's 250, there you go. So for example, this is the ProMega ladder that you'll be using. This is the one on the left. So if you compare that to this picture, it's not quite as clear because I think this is a slightly higher percentage gel. But you have the same bands present, right? The bright ones are 1,000, 3,000, and then 8 and 10. And if you look here, you have 1,000, 3,000, 8,000, and 10,000 up here. 
right so and then the the other one here it is i know there's somewhere in here this is a much less straightforward list right i could never remember the different numbers which is why i put it in here but the biggest one here is six seven five one ah come on there you go so this one here is 6751 base pairs and that kind of compares pretty well to this one over here which is 6000 so normally if you were just looking to see whether or not you got a band of approximately the right size like if you do it a pcr or a restriction digest or cloning or something or other right then this would be perfectly adequate because if your band is about four and a half thousand base pairs and that looks about four and a half thousand base pairs like yay it worked right you're all happy but the problem is is that these bands often fall between the markers and so if you had some dna which you didn't know the size of like you weren't expecting a particular size you're trying to figure out the size then these markers aren't sufficient because they are not they don't have every single possible size present in there they're a ladder right they have distinct kind of bands which are separated by some distance in terms of size even this one over on the left hand side still has gaps fewer than this one but they're still there. So if your band falls within one of these gaps, all you can say is that it's bigger than one and smaller than the other one. You can't actually say exactly what size it is. So that's why you're going to do this lab. And so what you're going to do is you're going to use these two markers. So the one on the left is the ProMega marker. The one on the right is the Edvatec marker. And you're going to use those markers to draw a graph because you know two bits of information. One, you know the size because that's given to you here in the lab handout. And two, you'll know the migration distance because you're going to measure that. And so with that, you can construct a standard curve. And so what do I mean by migration distance? So essentially what you're going to do is either from the top of this image or from you know, some line somewhere in there, as long as it's straight across, you're going to measure how far each of these bands moves or has moved. Right? For this marker, which will generate one graph. Remember, there's two graphs for this lab. And for this marker, which will generate a second graph. And essentially, what you'll be doing, if I get back to this, say this is for the ProMega marker, right? The one on the left. You're going to have a size, base pair here. You're going to have distance, centimeters there. You always have to put units in your axes, otherwise they don't make any sense. And essentially, you will have a logarithmic, oops, one too many zeros there scale and that's what a log scale looks like it's kind of funky to be honest and so in that you'll have how does it go actually i can't remember which way around it kind of looks like hey doc that. is it possible to make your screen a little bit bigger oh yeah i'm sorry forgot to stop the share no it's okay there you go good reminder though can't remember which whether the the dot like the dashes get close together or further apart as you go up in size for log. doesn't really matter. It looks kind of like this. Having your y-axis as a log scale is super, super important though. 
because otherwise you're you will not get a straight line you'll get a curve and so what you then need to do is go back to that image of a gel and measure the distance that each band has moved for a given size. So for example, the very topmost band, it's 10,000 base pairs. And let's say we have, so you could measure that out on your computer screen. You could print out a copy of that gel picture and use that. Um, depends how careful of your computer screen you are, I guess. You could even put it into a piece of software if you're technically literate or at least more literate than I am and use that to measure distances. That'd actually be a pretty funky way of doing it. I haven't done that myself, but uh, it would be a neat way of doing it. But either way, you will then plot those distances by size. So for the 10,000 base pair one, maybe you'll have something like that. And, and so then the- What eight... is the, I'm sorry. Go on. What does the 10,000 base pair correlate to? Like in what Ooh. we're getting? Give me just a second. I've got to share my screen again. Come on. So, these bands here, Marissa, all have a known size. And if you go okay. to the lab handout, it will tell you what those sizes are. So let's see if I can actually get this, uh, if I can get it side by side. Go on, go away, zoom bar. There you go, that kind of works. So it's not a perfect match size-wise because they're a little bit different scales. But you can see the top band here is 10,000 base pairs. This is our pro mega marker. The next size band is an 8,000 base pair band and that will move a little bit further. And then the next one, 6,000, four, no, five, four, and then this bright one is 3,000 base pairs. And so you need to measure the distance from a given point on this image. Doesn't actually really matter where, as long as it's the same for every single one of these samples. And measure in whatever units you wish, how far those bands have moved. Because what you're doing is you're plotting size by distance. Does that make sense? So we're, you're saying we're measuring from the top to the band, not uh, so vertically, not horizontally we're measuring. Correct. So okay. the distance of, of travel is from, you can just see this well here, right? This kind of faint kind of rectangle at the top right here. Yes. That's where the sample originally was put. You can't see it from the others, so but it, it's there nonetheless. And the DNA travels down the gel from that point, spreading out as it does so based on its size. And so what you want to know is what's the relationship between size and distance traveled for this particular gel. If I have a, a band that has traveled 3.35 centimeters, let's say, or actually just 3.3 centimeters. What size in base pairs is that band? That's what you want to find out. Okay, got it, thank yeah. you. But the only way that you can do that is with bands of a known size, which are gonna be your markers, the ones on the left and the ones on the right. Those are the ones that will allow you to figure out that relationship. And that's essentially what the graph you're drawing is for. 
Oh, Evie, someone's here for you. Have fun, love. So if you were to plot out the second band, then that's 8,000 base pairs, which would be about there, give or take. And that'll move it just a little bit further. Right, so that's the second band from the top in the picture on uh, Blackboard or in your lab handout on the left-hand side. And essentially, you do that for all of the bands, or at least as many as you, you can stomach doing, because there are a lot there. And if you do, what you should get is a inverse relationship between size and distance. And so what that really means is that the smaller the fragment, the greater the distance it will move, and vice versa. Now, once you've done that, this alone is not sufficient. What you need is a straight line. And so with your best judgment, and this is, you can do it in Excel and it will use its Excel judgment, but you can also do it yourself and use your own best judgment of the line of best fit through all these points. And generally speaking, the aim is to minimize the distance of each point from that line, right? So you don't you don't kind of get it like so, like because it fits really well these points, but then it's a really terrible fit for these ones, right? Or you don't draw like so because it's a really good fit for those two and it's a terrible fit the other ones. What you do is try and make it the best fit possible for all of the points. And so it should look something like that, give or take. It's actually probably one of the best straight lines I've drawn for a long time. Okay, and what that straight line is, and kind of, uh, oh, give me a sec, second, Valeria, I'll answer your question in a bit. What that line is, is, a, is the relationship between size, fragment, and distance moved. So this is your standard curve, which is actually a straight line because we use them in log, which is our size to distance relationship. That's what we need for both Promega and the Edvatec markers. Yes, Valeria, that's exactly right. So the one on the left is the pro mega marker you need to make a graph for that one and then you need to make a second graph for the one on the right which is the edvatech marker so the give me a second jordan the one on the right will take you a lot less time right because it has fewer bands in it and you can make your own hypothesis as to which is going to be more accurate ah give me a second rose i'll get to that in a bit jordan you had a question Point. Yes, sir. I guess I just didn't see the uh, example we had very well. Is there like a direct relationship between no uh, on the the actual picture of the the markers or the distance they moved? Is there like a direct relationship between the distance and the size of it, or is it like exponential? Like a smaller thing will move, I don't know, ten times the distance of a larger thing, or is it like it's not a linear relationship? Okay, uh, because. But it's not an exponential relationship either. It's it's a logarithmic relationship, essentially. Oh, okay. So that's why you plot it on a log scale uh, for the size, because yeah. they don't... Yeah, it's not a direct linear relationship between size and distance, but it is a logarithmic relationship. Okay, so awesome. if, Thanks, if you oh. did this without a log scale, what you get is a really pretty curve like so that's the kind of the uh 
more straightforward representation, I guess, but this is a more useful one. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah. So Rose, that's a really good question and yours too, John. Um, that's what we're gonna do next, right? So if you look at, I'm just gonna share the screen again to get back to that image. Here we do. Okay, so you've worked out the size by distance relationship for this marker, the ProMega marker, and this one, the Edvitec marker. Now you have three lanes of unknown markers. This lane has one large band, not markers, sorry, bands. Unknown bands. This one has a piece of DNA of unknown size, unknown. Uh, this one has two and this one has three. And so what you can see here is that for at least some of them, these bands lie between the bands of the markers. And so you want to figure out what is the size of these bands, all of them, by using the distance they've moved. So essentially for these unknowns, you have one piece of information you have the distance that they have moved on the gel. But thanks to these graphs, you have a size to distance relationship. And so what you do now, Rose, is that you do the same thing, you measure, and these questions are on Blackboard too. So they'll, if you look and go, oh shoot, I didn't actually measure the distance, that would be like a cue to do so. Now you measure the distance for this one band from the same point that you measured the distances for these bands and these bands, right? Got to use the same point all the way through, otherwise it's not going to work. So from that same point, you measure the distance this one has moved. And now the magic happens. It's like Disney. Now you go, okay, my top band is has moved 2.6 centimeters let's say I'm not saying that is what you will measure but just as an example using this stuff now you're going to use this relationship to calculate the size of the band actually in a similar way to using that chi square chart you're going to draw a straight line up from your known piece of information down here until it hits that uh, standard curve, that relationship. And you're going to draw a line across and then read out the size. And so that should be, oh shoot, I don't know, let's say 6,000. Can't actually remember what is the largest size of that fragment. Oh, maybe move it along a little bit. say about there. And that will give you say 4,400 base pairs. That's your unknown one. And then you do the same again, you're going to be doing this on both graphs, right? So for your ProMega graph, you're going to plot this and then you have a similar, but probably not exactly the same standard curve on your Edvitec graph. You'll still put in the distance that that fragment moved and use that line on your Edvitec graph to calculate the size of the fragment. Now for your second bands, what size are we looking at about here? I'm just making sure I'm giving you kind of roughly correct 
information. And Professor, on the the picture of the gel on the left side, it's going to be every single marker that we're measuring? Uh, as many as you have the patience and tolerance to do. Oh, okay. The more, the more the better, but if they're faint and you can't easily separate them out in terms of distance, then don't worry about them. But try and oh. get as many of them as you can. Yeah, because I thought that that was the example of the echo type or the, you know, like the base pair size next to it. So, I, but now I realize we have to actually measure each of those. Yeah, so the, the base pair size is one of the two bits of information that you need to draw this line. The other one is the distance that they move. Does that make sense? No, yes, that makes sense. I just thought that like the picture, I thought that that was showing us like an example of what's on the worksheet, you know, on the, right. but it's not. It's No, you need to use the, the gel picture in uh, Blackboard. It's actually in your handout too, but the one in Blackboard is a bit bigger. You need yes, to use this one. this one. Okay. And so you. once you've done, found one unknown, then you do the same for this one, right? And that would be, uh, let's say, can't actually remember the sizes off the top of my head. They're on Blackboard anyway. Um, let's say there'll be one here. And again, you do the same thing going over. And then there's going to be one much smaller over here. Same deal though, you go up to the line and you read off the size of the fragments from the X axis. And you have to do that for all three lanes. So the first one has only one size band in it. Second one has two and the third one has three. And then the blackboard assignment will and my old bones. Um, the blackboard assignment down here. Okay, so here are the actual sizes, and you're going to be comparing what you calculate. Oh, crab sticks! I didn't share my screen. There we go. These are the actual size of the fragments. So you're going to be comparing what you find with what it actually is, right? To see which of those two ladders or molecular weight markers or standards are better. And so the assignment will lead you through that process. So the first is obviously drawing the graphs because that's what you need. So you need to, you need to do the, the slog work of measuring the bands, how far they've moved, plotting those against uh, size of the bands, right? And then drawing that straight line. And then the questions kind of lead you through the things that you need to do, right? So what are the migration distances of the unknown fragments? You've got six in total. You can split them up into unknown one, two, and three, right? And if you go back to, uh, where are we at? Go back to the handout. This is our unknown one, unknown two, and unknown three. So you need to put the sizes for all of those, right? So you're going to have six different values to add here. Just write them out. And then you're going to be asked to use your two different graphs to calculate the sizes, right? So again, for each of those six different bands, calculate the size of the ProMega standard and then with the Edvatec standard. And then it's basically a uh, kind of subjective comment as to which you think is better, ProMega or the Edvatec size and standard. And why do you think it gave a better one? It actually might not be what you think. It's always kind of fun to see what students kind of come out with here. So which do you think is better and why do you think it's better than the other one? So just have a think about what you're actually doing and kind of put that down for your answer. 
So it's a bit of, you know, kind of almost feels like a kind of kindergarten style stuff of like using a ruler and a pencil and paper and stuff to kind of measure things out. But it really does get you thinking about how this process works. And this is how you are able to interpolate between two different values, not just for DNA, but, you know, really for anything that you might want to do. So, yeah, there you go. That's pretty much what the lab is. So make sure you do clear graphs, either on that paper or in Excel. I, I really don't mind. But you have to use a log scale for the band size. Otherwise, you won't get a straight line. You'll get a curve. Load those up. Make sure you label them, like which one's ProMega, which one's Edvatech. If you have an Excel file in which you have both of those uh, graphs, just upload the same one twice. Now look at, you know, it's not going to make any difference, but then I'll at least know that you have both of them there. And then calculate the, well, figure out the distances moved by the unknown fragments, calculate the sizes of those unknown fragments using your two graphs, and then tell me which you think is better and why. And that's it. So once you've drawn the graphs, that's going to take the most time of all of this that'll probably be about half hour maybe something like that second one will be quicker the evertech one is way quicker than the pro mega one it won't take you very long to do the rest of it probably about an hour in total for the for the whole assignment does anybody have questions 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 so as always, it kind of seems relatively straightforward when I'm telling you about it uh, in person or, you know, on Zoom. Um, and when you come back to it and do it yourself, sometimes it doesn't make quite as much sense. Uh, so, again, we will be able to go over any questions next Thursday. to think which day of the week we're at. Uh, this Thursday, in fact. Uh, if you have any questions before the due date is is ready for submitting your assignment. And on Thursday, we'll be going over some chi-squared stuff, so we'll have some more chance to practice uh, the chi-squared test, goodness of fit too, which will be valuable as well. So that's pretty much it from me. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? All right. Awesome source. Thanks very much, everybody. Hope you have a lovely rest of your afternoon. All this stuff will be up. Oh, I might make myself a coffee first, perhaps. Uh, but after I've had a coffee and my eyes are pointing in the right direction, in the same direction, I'll point, post all this up as well as a um, new lab schedule or correct lab schedule. And also check to make sure I have DSS stuff for everybody that needs it. And yeah, that'd be it. Arr. Cool. See you all on Thursday. If anyone has questions about material for the exam, stuff like that, uh, you can contact me uh, separately. I'm always happy to uh, meet by Zoom if you have stuff that you want to go over outside of class. And if none of that applies, but you want to talk about stuff in class, then bring those questions to class too. All right, I want to make sure that you're as fully prepared for the first exam as you can be. Cool. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Catch you later.